Okay, so we're going to look at x-ray diffraction. Specifically, we want to derive Bragg's law. Okay, that's what we're going to look at. <clears throat> so let's um, let's start here with a little sketch. So we know that there's going to be an X-ray source. Often it's a copper source. There's a electron transitions in energy, and then um, oops, there's a going to be some um, radiation released from that and it hits a sample. That's what I was going to draw over here, sample. And it hits this sample and then it reflects off the sample or interacts with the sample a little bit and goes to an x-ray detector. Detector. There we go. Okay, so it comes in instant there and there's actually an angle that it uh, hits the sample at. It does something with the sample. So we're going to want to understand what exactly is going on there. And then the detector picks up the radiation and then tells us the intensity of the radiation. And it gives us this plot of intensity, that is, how bright is the radiation versus the angle. And the angle actually, by, for historical reasons, is plotted as 2 theta. So what happens is there's some radiation that's quite low in intensity, not very much is getting to the detector. And then at certain values of 2 theta, certain angles, we get these peaks. And it might look something like this. So there's these certain, these particular angles that are giving us these peaks. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to understand what it is that's causing these peaks. Why? What, what's going on? What is it that's happening? Something has to be happening here in the sample to cause that. <clears throat> so what we should do is look at more detail here, this little region of the sample, to try to understand that. Okay, so I'm doing a little call out here as best I can with my limited artistic abilities. And here's a couple of planes on the surface of the sample and what I'll do is I'll just try and cartoon depiction of some some atoms. So what we can see now is at the surface of the sample there's atomic planes that are revealed to the surface. There's certain planes that are parallel to the surface. Okay, so these are um, like I said these are atomic uh, planes. And what you might also know from uh, from crystallography um, or crystallographic planes and directions is that we could we could name these with a, sort of a mathematical notation uh, using Miller indices HK and L. There's a certain specific plane that we're looking at HK and L. And then what I mean here by this next one down is that that the next plane is the same plane. It's it's parallel to the first, but just translated in space. So uh, for for example, example only we could be looking at, say if this is a cube, a cubic system, well we could be looking at the, the top plane of a cube and the next plane down just if a, sim it's a simple cubic uh, situation here, this plane. Right, those could be the planes that we're, we're looking at. And so of course you'd realize that this is the 0, 0, 1, that is H, K, and L. Are zero zero and one, and this is again zero zero one as well. This is an example. So don't really get too hung up over where these atoms are in space. I'm just drawing a cartoon depiction of the atoms, and then some radiation comes in and hits the, the sample, and some of the radiation though bypasses that first layer and hits the second plane down. And what we what we know is that the radiation coming um, coming out of the source here has a wavelength, and these two beams that I've depicted, beam one, and we'll call it beam two, are um, in phase with with one another. So here, let me just define the wavelength for you. Okay, wavelength. They have a defined wavelength lambda 
And the two of them are in phase with one another. That means the peak of one corresponds to the peak of another, and the trough of one corresponds to the trough of another. <clears throat> it's worthwhile just to spend a, a moment more time describing that. So here we go if we have beam 1 and beam 2, and clearly they, they're starting off at the same point like this. Well, if we sum those two up, the result will be a waveform with should be the same wavelength. So I tried as best I could to draw the same wavelength lambda there. That's a bad looking lambda, isn't it? Let's, let's erase that. Try to do a better lambda. There we go. And the amplitude, though, so amplitude A is now doubled. So now the amplitude is 2A. And this is what we call um, <clears throat> constructive interference. And this occurs when the two uh, waves are in phase with one another. The peaks correspond to the peaks and the troughs to the troughs. And in fact, this is going to give us a high amplitude. This gives us a high intensity. So really, what we're saying is our peaks are occurring when we have constructive interference. So what we'd really like to do is we'd like to understand when these two waves here are going to be in phase with one another and give constructive interference. And we can figure that out with a little bit of simple geometry. If I draw a perpendicular line there to the um, to beam number two, and I draw, identify a point here, call it point A, well, by the time beam two has traveled to point A, it's traveled the same distance as beam number one. They're parallel to each other at the same wavelength, so they will be in phase with one another. But then beam two, you'll see, has to travel this additional distance to point B, and then again, additional distance to point C. And of course, geometry will tell us that line segment AB is equal to BC. So wave number two, or, or ray, beam number two, has had to travel the distance AB twice longer than beam number one. And we want to know when that extra distance is going to leave beam number one and beam number two in phase with one another. So let's take a, a look at another situation. Actually, let me just draw this over here for you. So say this is beam number one now, and I'm going to draw beam number two. So beam number one, again, there it is, coming along. And what about, though, if I hold back beam number two? So I get it to start back here. Well, what if if it has been held back by this certain value, specifically the wavelength? Well, then it starts uh, its next cycle exactly the same place as the first, and they're back in phase with one another. So when beam number two is held back or is out of phase by a multiple of the wavelength, whether it's one wavelength, or you could even have two wavelengths if you continued it out to the left, right? You continued and you said, well, instead we started it back here. And then, or we could start it out here. Three times lambda. By the time it gets to this point, they will be in phase. So what we need to do is we need to say, okay, when this extra distance, AB plus BC, is equal to a multiple of the wavelength, they will be in phase with, with one another. So let's look at this little triangle here. I'll sketch that for you right here. And we can just about wrap up our discussion. So here's point A, point A, here's point B, and we said BC is the same as AB. So what we need to do is we need to discover how long AB is. Well, if we look at our sketch here, and we see that this angle is theta. Well, if that's, this is going to be 90 minus theta, so therefore this has to be theta again. So I can add that to this angle. This is theta. And then, of course, you can see, well, if we only knew this distance here, the hypotenuse, we would know that the hypotenuse times sine theta would be equal to line segment AB. <clears throat> but we do know that distance, or we could describe it, because we know it's the distance between planes with the Miller indices h, k, and l. So it's a distance. We're going to call it d 
it's DHKL, right? The plate spacing between planes with the Miller indices H, K, and L. So then, like I said, this is going to be sine theta times, I'll write it out this way, actually, DHKL times sine theta. That's what this extra distance, that's what that distance AB is equal to. <clears throat> so, see if we can wrap this up here. Beam 2 travels 2 times the line segment AB further than beam 1. Well, if that extra distance that beam 2 travels right here is equal to a multiple of the wavelength, if 2 times AB equals an integer of the wavelength, then it will be constructive. And if it's constructive, like we said up here, it will give us a peak. So what we're doing is we're saying, well, the condition for that peak is the special geometry or special um, angle giving the extra distance um, equal to a multiple of the wavelength. And that is essentially Bragg's law. So let's just summarize it, and that's an integer. Okay. So Bragg's law then just equates those. It says an integer multiple of the wavelength. Let's try that again. I'm having a lot of trouble with lambda today. Is going to be equal to 2 times AB, which we said was DHKL sine theta. Fantastic. So that is, in fact, <clears throat> Bragg's law. And it's just based on the condition for constructive interference.